quite a few dropouts. Our keynote speaker uh, was unable to catch his flight, Dr. Alok Tekrewal, and uh, a lot of people from our panel uh, could not make it. However, a warm welcome, and we have our session convener, Dr. Jayashree Seishekhar, and our co-convener, uh, Dr. Taranum Fatima, who's here with us. I request them to kindly come onto the stage. WAS was started on the premise that every woman uh, ophthalmologist should have a platform of her own. Uh, this was uh, considered to be an anomalous response to abnormal fears, but it has found validation over a period of time. And now uh, WAS has become a force to reckon with. The acceptance has been gradual, but it has been definite. And I can assure you that day by day, a number of people, are, uh, especially women of ophthalmologists, who were reluctant at first, are now welcoming it, understanding it, and joining it. There are a number of uh, earlier initiatives which were taken and which happened before the uh, germ of a thought of this session. There was Project Urchana, which started recently after the demise of a uh, suicide of a doctor. Uh, who was being harassed by her patients. There was another project, Shakti, which was devised to uh, prevent the women from harassment at their workplace. We have different research modules, and uh, there was a certified course over the period of three months, which was conducted by WAS, and it was very well attended. And it was a certified course for research, and it was in the association with the Department of Science and Technology. Uh, there have been collaborations on behalf of WAS, which has promoted research activities in established and upcoming ophthalmologists. The Mentor Mentee program, all of us are aware, and it's still on. And you, have, you can find a guide all over the country, from anywhere, any part of the country, and you can uh, just they are at a phone call away. The RED project, the Rare Eye Disease project, we have an entire issue of IJO, which was dedicated to this, and this has been the WAS brainchild. So the latest initiative has been the WAS Care. This is a foray of WAS into observership and fellowship programs. What entirely right now the idea is to have a three-month fellowship program. It can be an observership or it can be a hands-on training program at selected centers. There will be an exit exam and you will properly get a degree for that. So this is the latest uh, brainchild of Dr. Mohita Sharma and we are hoping to initiate this and this program is all about it to tell you the benefits of it. There's a, uh, there's a small video that I would like to show and that showcases the promise that is there in
The first talk that we'll start with is Dr. Chaitra's because she has a presentation in, some, in another session as well. And the topic is, can short-term fellowships and observerships help in upgradation? Dr. Chaitra needs no introduction, an alumni of Bangalore Medical College and Research Institute, and she is the head of VR services at Narayan Netrale, Bangalore. She has been actively involved in editorial management, scientific publications, and translational research at her institute, and has also been associated with IGO in the editorial board. Currently, she is also joint secretary at IOS with over 130 PubMed indexed articles. She is a force to reckon with in ophthalmology. Welcome, Dr. Chetra. Thank you, Ranjana. Pleasure to be part of WAS. Uh, been there with uh, WAS since its uh, inception. And uh, to stand here now to speak about, uh, you know, the importance of short-term fellowships, especially as the concluding, uh, you know, remark from Ranjana and the video was about uh, three-month uh, duration short fellowships that WAS wants to be, uh, you know, uh, making a foray into. Uh, let me just quickly talk about uh, the different, uh, you know, aspects of a short-term fellowship. I can't really call it a fellowship, I would just call it an observership because uh, since us is a predominantly a surgical based uh, fellowship, it's rather difficult to imbibe those uh, skills within a three month period. If you are opting for a medical observership, yes it does help because uh, in three months you will pick up the nuances. But surgical, uh, considering that I work in the VR department, in three months it's next to impossible if you are a fresher right out of your post graduation. But of course, if you've already done and you just want to get back into the hang of it, maybe yes, but still VR is tough. I do know short-term uh, cataract fellowships and even laser fellowships that are quite uh, helpful. Uh, refractive again, I think should work, but uh, it depends like plasty, you may not be able to see all of it in the first three months itself. So surgical fellowships, like for example, in our uh, center, we do have a simulator. It's called the VR magic. So in those uh, simulators, it helps in the sense that you're able to grade yourself and score yourself. After every step of the surgery, the AI will tell you whether you did a good job, you, how was your tissue handling, how was your speed of operating, like our fellows go and do ILM peels, they do vitrectomy, they do uh, lasers. Uh, and it's, it's a, a lot of skill enhancement with the uh, VR magic or the simulator because uh, it teaches you uh, ambidextricity so you can use both your uh, hands to do it. It also grades you in terms of stability, uh, you know, it gives you a, a, a zigzag pattern and you have to pass a loop through that. So it helps you, you know, get control of your uh, stability as well. So I'm just going to speak now briefly about uh, a fellowship that I did. Uh, it is called a fellowship and hence I will speak about it. But uh, to tell you, like I mentioned, that wasn't my first fellowship. I finished a full-time two-year fellowship at Aditya Jyothai Hospital for my VR under Dr. Natarajan. And then I took a maternity break, which is okay to take. And then I took another one and a half year fellowship just to come back into the field again. I didn't want to straight away join, you know, because I had taken almost a three or four year break and I didn't want to do a surgical speciality without getting back into it. So I did a fellowship at the same place that I had done my UG and PG, so it felt good to be back. Uh, and it also helped me hone my skills there because, uh, you know, uh, during a fellowship, you always have the uh, cover of a consultant helping you out. And only after that, I joined uh, Nara Netralia. And in fact, during my uh, stint at Nara Netralia is when I went in for an uh, ICO fellowship. So that is what I want to elaborate a little bit on and how it helped me. And uh, even though I went in for an ICO fellowship at the Doheny Eye Institute and uh, UCLA, um, I frankly didn't go for clinical work. I did have the advantage of doing a little bit of clinical work with Dr. Sadda up there. He is basically a medical retina specialist and one of the most successful medical retina specialists there is, uh, you know, in the field. He is a pioneer in a lot of uh, trials and also right now he is doing a lot of work in AI. So I basically went to his center for three months to learn a little bit more about imaging because as you know right now imaging is like the most important uh, you know thing for ophthalmologists right from our diagnosis to our monitoring and to AI based diagnostics it's, it's really big. So these were some of my uh, colleagues there who were also doing fellowship in fact the boy next to me is uh, just post MBBS. He came in to work there for six months to a year just to understand it more so that he can decide on which branch he wants to go for in ophthalmology also. So these were the other research fellows and I must tell you half of them standing there are not even ophthalmologists. 
a lot of them are just science graduates and some of them are even optometrists so that there's that much of amount of work that can be done even for non ophthalmologists so i think uh, for us there are no limits so why i went there was to be part of something called as a reading center i if uh, all of you all are aware a uh, reading center is basically part of clinical trials wherein suppose you're looking at a drug effect and you want to read the octs it has to go to a certified reading center so here they have reading center protocols for fundus photos fas stocts gonios the works so if you are going to conduct a trial a multi center trial or a drug trial all the images that you process will be sent to a reading center where they will be objectively read graded and sent back to you to see the response to treatment so they can also be disease specific with respect to vascular it could be amd a lot of work on uh, ga and cnvs are going on glaucoma also and of course macular edema so like i said we had science graduates we had recorded lectures we had ophthalmic books training manuals and then at the end of 3 months i did get my icu fellowship but i did more than that i learned a lot about imaging i learned a lot about uh, the practices in the us uh, because how they treat uh, you know retinal diseases is completely different for example in the 3 months that i was there i don't remember dr sadda advising laser for one patient whether it was diabetic retinopathy or vein occlusions they hardly ever do lasers forget prps focals nothing all of it is anti vegf based treatment and second thing is uh, it is the uh, paramedical staff who give injections in the clinic in the opd of course the difference is that our ambient uh, you know atmosphere is not as clean you know as it is there so they just walk in they get the injection and they go back driving so it's it's that different from what we practice here so these are the three month fellowships that are available on icu it's given twice a year with application deadlines of march 31st and september 30th if you have done your icu exams the basic advanced and uh, clinical before your chances are higher but i do know people who have managed to get this icu fellowship even without prior uh, doing the icu exams if it is called as fic or the fellowship of the icu Uh, i have just listed out the retina fellowships but there are a whole lot of others they are all 3 month fellowships you have for glaucoma you have multiple of them and uh, uh, they do give some amount of funding so it does help you for that 3 month of travel and stay it is a different experience and i think uh, the cut off age is 40 so uh, any of you are lesser than that must uh, give it a try and uh, what more can you do during the 3 months is that i also managed to go to baskam pharma and learn a little bit more about some newer imaging modalities so making the most of even that 3 months because it's not next door you can't keep going again and again and so you might as well maximize it so this was at uh, baskam pharma and i also got a present papers on an international forum and uh, so this was in 2015 see so you get these tags like first time attendee and moderator and communicator so these are some really uh, you know things that you can do that you can't do here you know sitting at one place so you must take a chance apply and get it and uh, that's that's about it yes these are just personal moments you know you when you go, go there you might as well see the place visit and see what's different there and these are some things you all may want to uh, you know capture because uh, these are all the resources for all fellowships and definitely for short term fellowships this is on e of the this is on our uh, vrsf website i learn also has a couple of uh, you know resources and uh, your times so all these four websites you'll get a lot of information about the short term fellowships thank you so much any questions or Uh, you know any doubts about any of these uh, courses anybody would like to ask i am anyway around you can ask me i think we can go to the next talk excellent talk dr chatra and very informative <laughs> yes i'm sure our uh, young colleagues have learned and uh, will use these opportunities to enhance their skills and upgrade themselves okay. yeah and uh, i would really like to have an opinion of the chair whether uh what you really believe that how much time do you need to really have a hang of a sub speciality if you are going into a training ha i request dr bharti kashyap to come on to the chair so what i feel like when you are a fresh pass out like you have just uh, done your post graduation you can go in for a longer term you know two year kind which can really enhance you your skills your knowledge everything but then if you don't do it then and then if you at later point of time when you are working in an institute or you are having your own setup it's difficult to take off two years time 
So these are the times when you just want to brush up something, then these short term fellowships are good. At least you know, you have done those things, but you have lost the confidence or you just need to brush it up. So you can go in for this shorter term. Yeah, it's a, actually a very nice idea because many times uh, uh, women of the knowledge, they don't get time for this long term fellowships and they are very busy. And this uh, short term fellowship is exactly what they need at that moment. So, very nice, Dr. Chaitra, very nice. Thank you, Dr. Chaitra. And I think uh, we'll let her go because she has a presentation in another session. Do we have Dr. Ipsita over here? Yeah. So, now we start with the trials and tribulations of an aspirant for skill upgradation. Just give a brief introduction of Dr. Ipsita. Uh, she is an MS in ophthalmology from JSS Mysore, MRCSE from Edinburgh, and a fellowship in glaucoma and I I IOL from BBI Foundation. And currently, she is a junior consultant at Trinetrala, Kolkata, with her interest area being glaucoma and phaco retractive surgery. She is just on the verge of searching into training programs, looking into options in life, and let us hear her experience. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be speaking amid such esteemed ophthalmologists. And I'm just a newbie to the world of ophthalmology. And here are my trials and tribulations. So MBBS done, and there was this monster of neat exam. Got into my dream branch of MS Ophthal. And in this era of globalization, I thought the whole world is open to me. So I thought about India, USA, UK, Australia, Canada. On a personal note, the whole quest for abroad was because the guy I wanted to marry then and my husband currently, he's in USA. And so we just wanted a place where we could grow in our careers together and stay together. So June 2020 completed my MS Ophthal and peak COVID. Most fellowships for the immediate batch was actually on hold. Routes to rest of the world only got more and more unclear. My first thought was USA because he was there, but looking into it, I needed to take my US Emily which would mean going back to all the subjects and the exams itself would take three more years. And even if I got through all the exams, there was a huge doubt that if I would at all get into residency in Ophthal, not just that I have to do residency. So I had just finished uh, MS Ophthal. I was all in love with the subject, wanted to learn so much more, wanted to learn surgeries. And the idea that I might not get into ophthalmology at all was uh, something I couldn't go through. So looking into Canada, Australia, and even in UK, the PLAB route, all of them left me the same doubt that it might not just be ophthal at all. So uh, then I realized UK does accept few more pathways, like uh, if I could get a FRCS Glasgow, or MRCS Edinburgh in oph ophthalmology, or FRCS Edinburgh, and of course the Fellowship of Royal College of Ophthalmologists, those would give me a GMC registration, and after that I could apply for jobs. So ICO uh, seems to be a, you know, they're a popular set of examinations and they were in college, so I'd started them already. In 2020, I did get my MRCS Edinburgh and I thought that gives me a GMC. Uh, and as per this pathway, I can get a GMC and a job and things would work out. I had timed everything perfectly. But then I made one big mistake. There was this one, one small line written which said that the college letter must also confirm that you've sat the OSCE component. Now, through the ICO route, there was no OSCE component, and I wasn't aware, so that wouldn't get me my GMC. And later on, my second mistake, after talking to people who actually work in UK, I've realized that the pathway should have always been, uh, I should have always taken the FRC ophthalmologist uh, exam, because that's the exam which people working in UK or studying in UK take, and that's the exam if I want to have a career there. Uh, that would help me grow even there. If I would ever want to become a consultant in UK, I would need to complete those set of examinations anyway. So looking at the Glasgow route, the ICO would 
exempt me from the first two papers and I could directly take the third paper. But then again, at this time I didn't note the footnote which said that I need six years of clinical experience in ophthalmology, which I still don't have. So that wasn't a choice. Uh, the Fellowship of Royal College of Ophthalmologists, I took the part one last year again and the rest of the exams are yet to follow. Then I came across Medical Training Initiative, which is a dual sponsorship scheme. So I need to have an Indian sponsor who knows, actually knows a UK sponsor. And if the trust agrees after an interview, they can give me a certificate of sponsorship with which I can apply for GMC and a visa. So I do have a certificate of sponsorship from a trust now and in process of uh, the GMC application. And I'm hoping it works out. So it has been a long road, quite uncertain. Uh, it's too many websites, too many informations, very unnerving at times. But in the meanwhile, I've been blessed with great mentors, <coughs> the freedom to work and push to grow. Patients who shower you with love and trust in India and slowly but steadily getting better a little more every day, or at least I know I'm trying, and all of it while I'm still home. So I'm sure the universe has a grand plan and I would like to believe the world is my oyster and I am the pearl. No matter where I am, <laughs> thank you. No matter where I am eventually, I hope I represent India right. I hope I can learn from the whole world. I hope I can contribute to the world of ophthalmology. That's my vision for a better vision. And uh, no better platform than AIOS midterm to say that charu taraf gyan bat raha hai, jahan se mile lapet lo. Thank you. Very nice talk by Dr. Ishita. One thing I'd like to suggest my juniors, especially those who are doing their MS, that you can do your uh, ICO, give your ICO exam you are doing when you are doing your second year MS. So uh, in the third uh, year, you can, after giving the final exam, you'll, you can give the second paper. And that way you can clear it, uh, both the papers you can clear after your exams. So if you have this I uh, ICO in your bag, then you can easily apply for these fellowships. So better to do it early when you are doing, while you are doing it in MS. We did it uh, when we were in second year. Would you like to make a comment, uh, Dr. Bharti? Oh, and nowadays the girls are so aware. I was just listening to her. Very nice. They know all the ways. They just have to reach the target. And there are so many pathways. They are so much aware. And I am getting her. <laughs> the sad part is that... And uh, the, but still, the sad part is that she goes to UK, but the husband still is living in the US. Is it? <laughs> He'll shift to UK. <laughs> so. Okay. So when you were in UK, your husband shifted to UK. If she goes to UK, then. Oh, if you. So what is he doing right now? He's actually a data scientist, so his job opportunities are much better abroad. So, but okay. he do want to come back eventually. But for now, he needs to be somewhere UK, USA works out for him. But the path you have taken is good. Yeah. Actually, our keynote speaker, I talked to him also about, uh, you know, about yeah. getting to a dual sponsorship scheme. Yes, that is a thing I didn't know. Do we have Dr. Arindya here? She's not rich. Uh, we have Dr. Anusha Arvind. She's with us. Anindya is here. Yeah. Anindya is here. here. Okay. <laughs> Just a brief introduction I would give. No, no, she's Aditya. Yeah. Uh, she's an HOD in ophthalmology at uh, Medica Super Speciality Hospital in Ranchi and a mentor uh, at the Center for Ophthalmic Research and Training, a glaucoma specialist and enthusiastic researcher in the field of glaucoma. She's based at Ranchi and interestingly founder of the Adwait India Foundation. She lists it that has a number one involvement in her LinkedIn profile. Uh, good evening uh, everyone and uh, it's uh, really nice that uh, just a minute, I'm not finding my PPT. J uh, one. Okay. 
ओके यू आर चेंजिंग ओके फाइन फाइन ग्रेट सो गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन एंड थैंक यू वेरी मच ए आई ओ एस एंड वुमेन ऑफ्थर्मोलॉजी सोसाइटी टू गिव मी दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी टू प्रजेंट माई टॉपिक ऑन माई एक्सपीरियंस इन इंटरनेशनल फेलोशिप आई डन माई ग्लॉक माई फेलोशिप फ्राम यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ टोरटो कैनडा एंड बिकॉज आई हैव डन लॉन्ग टर्म फेलोशिप इट इज मोर रेलिवेंट फॉर इमीडिएट फ्रेस पास आउट एम एस और डी एन बी स्टूडेंट्स बिकॉज लॉन्ग टर्म मे बी ए चैलेंज फॉर गोइंग यू नो आफ्टर योर बिजी प्रैक्टिस सो लेट्स द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन दैट आई गेट फ्रॉम द रेस्ट एंड डॉक्टर्स इज इंटरनेशनल फेलोशिप रिक्वायर so for that thing i have a question do you know the conjugates of people company language when they're not ready to explore beyond their comfort zone we all know what nokia mobile went through so my answer will be leaving the comfort zone in every way possible is the best part of international fellowship there are multiple limitations of course the financial however it can be handled by a scholarship through international or national merit any sponsorship program or definitely through family also possible being uh, personal many questions come like if you are married if you have kids is it possible yes of course i went for my fellowship when my daughter was 2 and 1/2 year old and she was with me throughout my fellowship climatic condition we have to adjust for the food please try to explore thanks to indian food industry entrepreneurs they are present everywhere and cost cutting and maximizing time is must be a habit to cap uh, handle these are the opportunities that we will uh, go th- will get it the uh, question is how much we are utilizing it we may uh, use this an opportunity to settle abroad but be prepared to do their post graduation without that it is difficult to get consultancy if we are planning to implement our experience just back home please utilize the utilization of your holiday two days per week that saturday and sunday uh to increase your efficiency it will give you a habit of uh, you know the to realize the impact of uh, quality life and work in your outcome utilization of your mandatory research day out of 5 day one day is going to be research day that should be utilized and utilization of your one hour of lunch break and utilization of laser day pre planning and fixing high demanding observership like i have done my observership with dr ai kahmat when i was doing my fellowship with dr trop and dr bias utilization of your culture and spirituality to create strong and long term networks notice the positive work and academic cultures and its long term impact notice the success of conference without food also and utilize your id to explore the process of record keeping because you can go into everything and ongoing training options in other department and of course it enhances your resilience so the million dollar question comes to me do you get enough surgery what is the target of a surgeon to count the numbers or to get enough confidence to handle unavoidable complications enough understanding to avoid preventable complication so best thing is utilize your weight lab to satisfy your number counts because you actually get humanize uh when during our training that time in the weight lab also so these are the faqs when should i start preparing from the age our panelist esteem panelist have already mentioned from the first year because we have to go through the fico if you have it gives a lot of you know because i had fico it was my positive pact when i uh, uh, you know went through interview immediately after my post graduation so additional exam apart from fico frcs we can give you know after uh, the second part uh, uh, like uh, last part we will give after five years of experience as already you know mentioned by my previous speaker so research pe- uh, papers as much possible and do you need to be intelligent rather i will feel that you should have clarity of your thoughts so i have because uh, you know i have to emphasize on canada options so these are university of toronto options possible all you will say of kind of one year two year one year is quite sufficient and uh, you will quite go through uh, multiple things two years is your and mentor's choice this is university of british columbia you know, and uh, then comes the university of alberta these are all available in the net 
So University of Calgary, Calgary becomes a challenge because of the climatic condition. University of Manitoba, McMaster University, and University of Waterloo is very uh, you know, popular university and nice one also. Queen's University, Ottawa is the capital uh, a city of uh, you know Toronto as uh, so Canada so uh, however the language is Spanish so we have to learn that so University of Ottawa uh, Mag University of McGill uh, Dalhousie University University of Montreal the same thing that we have to go through you know uh, French uh, language you have to learn and uh, then uh, comes uh, you know these are all the references from where you can get all these details so coming to the point that my journey back home so can i contribute for my next generation so with that thought actually dr ranjana ma'am already mentioned that i started advaita india foundation to, and uh, even i have developed a training center whatever best i can do and uh, for which you know i show my gratitude to my mentor dr satveer singh who was my guide during post graduation and he was himself trained from wills eye hospital because of that he used to you know mentor us and give the vision that to proceed ahead for uh, you know international experience so uh, you know in his name we have started uh, just launched recently the international uh, fellowship sponsorship or scholarship program so you can visit through advet.org and uh, i'd like to thank my uh, you know uh, dr trope and dr bias my mentor from uh, canada who are ready to be in the selection board uh, so that it will be non biased and uh, completely fair and of course uh, major general dr abhijit chakraborty who was head of afmc pune to make sure that the candidate will come back and uh, you know uh give back to the society as a mentor for to the next generation thank you very much i look forward that a lot of you know international presentation will happen from india thank you very much very well spoken dr anindya and uh, very informative for our uh, young uh, post just who have completed a post graduation excellent opportunity to go and do so yours was a uh, two year fellowship no. one year, one year. And do they give surgical it. opportunity? Yeah. So she is, uh, yeah, she is a very successful glaucoma specialist uh, with a one-year fellowship, and she is in a position to guide so many of you into getting a sponsorship and getting a training in Canada if you are interested. And I simply told her that it's better to get the women to be trained abroad because they are the ones more likely to come back. Because the only caveat in this is that you have to come back after the training program. And they will, and they will not allow you to settle there. So you, uh, I mean, the women candidates and the WAS members, I would really encourage them to be in touch with her and understand the process and give it a shot. I think Canada is better for fellowship yeah. because they give you surgical exposure. Our they next speaker exposure. is uh, Dr. Anusha Arvind. She's come all the way from Bangalore. At a, just a simple request to speak in the WAS session. Very grateful to her. And just a brief introduction. Dr. Anusha, she's completed her MS in Ophthal from Wims Bellari and a fellowship in Orbit and Oculoplasty from Arvind Eye Hospital, Madurai. And then she pursued Neuro Ophthal from Singapore National Eye Hospital, Eye Center, it seems. Hobbies include painting and uh, reading and writing, but don't be, uh, don't be meandering, don't meander from your main uh, interest because uh, she is a very serious Neuro Ophthalmologist. I'd just like to welcome her. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the invitation and the kind words. So, um, I had a very, very interesting journey when I applied uh, 
for my fellowship because I was so confused and so lost, but finally found my way out. So um, Singapore, being a small city, didn't have so many options like the US or Canada. There are four basic hospitals that run there. And uh, basically two of them uh, uh, give fellowships, one being uh, Singapore National Eye Center and, the, and another one called Tantok Seng Hospital and also NUH. So, um, so some of the things that um, I actually didn't have any inclination for an international fellowship because I had done oculoplasty from the prestigious Arvindai Institute in Madurai. And I always thought, okay, uh, after doing so many DCRs and lit procedures, I'm just going to, you know, have a path. And uh, finally what happened was, um, contrary to all the decisions taken by myself and at home, I had to get married and my husband was in Singapore. And uh, so f I was still halfway through my oculoplasty fellowship and um, I really didn't know what I was going to do. So then I decided, of course after having got married, I thought, okay, let me explore Singapore. So um, I had completed my three parts of the ICO and two parts of my FRCS Glasgow, but my third part was still pending. So I thought, okay, I didn't really decide much. I just sent a few mails to SNEC, HRs, and uh, people I knew there, and just started doing a lot of talking. So I thought, where do I see after completion of the fellowship? I actually didn't think of neuroophthal till I entered Singapore. But then uh, my husband uh, and I wanted to be together. So we thought, why not? So we decided to see what are the pros and cons. So we thought, okay, let maybe there will be some, you know, a small area, a niche where I could find between oculoplasty and neuroophthal where I could maybe, uh, you know, uh, take that path. There's so much common things like optic neuropathy, thyroid, optic nerve decompression, all these things, a lot of dreams and imaginations. So we laid out a lot of pros and cons and we decided, okay, do you, I mean, do I really want to do this? And uh, do I see myself somewhere after doing all this? So before you make any decision, I feel you should identify your goals. So my, I was very interested in neuroophthalmology uh, when I was in Arvindai Hospital also, just based on some common referrals that we would get into the oculoplasty department. But I always thought it's a very difficult branch because there's so much neurology in it. But then I thought, okay, why not give it a try? So what do you want from the fellowship? So that was the first question actually asked to me by my mentor in Singapore. So you know, they always talk to an external person with the note that what do you want to take back to your community? They know you're, they're not going to retain you. So they always check for your aptitude rather than how much knowledge you know. So all they want to know when you go for an international fellowship is are you really interested? and how much knowledge do you want to take back and utilize in your own community. So the next thing I did was talk, talk and talk to a lot of people who did fellowships there. And um, that gives you a lot of l light because sometimes you just find somebody you can relate to who will actually give you answers to your questions. And the main thing is to put yourself really out there. You need to show them that you're interested. You are a foreigner after all. So, and then uh, what will the fellowship cost you? So if you only do what you can do, you'll never be more than uh, what you are right now. So always go the extra mile. And there's a huge lake of knowledge to get into and learn. And just one note on why in your ophthalmology, it is a very fascinating field with a lot of integration. There can be life-saving and vision-saving diagnosis. It involves a teamwork with a neurologist and a neurosurgeon. And there is some amount of intellectual satisfaction. But more so than anything, do you have the interest in your speciality that you want to do? 
And as a career uh, for a woman, I would like to say, my mentors really said one thing, you can save vision, you can save lives, and you get to be an unsung hero because you're the final referral point. If nobody knows what's happening, you're off their opinion. So as Oprah Winfrey says, passion is energy. Feel the power that comes from focusing on what excites you. So NeuroOftel has so much variety because there's so many systemic manifestations of so many things varying from optic neuritis to compressive neuropathy to ischemic optic neuropathy. Sometimes it's, um, you know, even myasthenia, all these random um, and multiple systemic disorders which will come for referrals to you. So these are some of the people that you can contact if you're interested in a fellowship. Um, so these are fellowship coordinators who will take care of your application process while you're there. It is a very, very, very tedious paperwork process that's involved. It took me almost nine months to complete it. So, and you need a lot of uh, referrals from your uh, mentors in India and everything needs to directly go to the Singapore Medical Council. So you're, there's no middleman involved. So everything is uh, verified to the T. And um, as you know, in Singapore, it's A, then B, then C. They'll never jump from A to C. So you need uh, all these things. And basically, it's a very intense uh, clinical, um, clinical diagnosis, history, systemic approach of multiple conditions a very, very good neuroradiology department and an electrophysiology department and multiple uh, platforms for education and research. And of course, I had a wonderful experience in the whole one year that I was there. And uh, there I am, three months pregnant also after my fellowship. And there is always something more to learn, even for a master. So. I think if anybody is interested, any extra uh, learning always adds uh, value to you at the end of the day. So there are all the fellowships in Singapore are one year fellowships. And uh, interestingly, because of the increased load of myopia in Singapore, they have a myopia fellowship also. And uh, thank you so much for your time. it is possible to get any surgical fellowship? Are there any options and opportunities available there? Yeah, in the surgical specialties, yes, you can. But surgical specialties have a long waiting period compared to the medical specialties. Mm -hmm. And um, I was actually looking for an oculoplastic fellowship and I couldn't, but they offered me lots. Okay. I mean, Thank you, Dr. Anusha. Uh, I'd like to now invite Dr. Minakshi Shiokan, and uh, she's an MS in Ophthal from PGIMS Rohtak, Fellowship in Cornea in Venua Institute and Research Center, Delhi, an ICO Fellowship in Cornea from Australia, and she's currently working in Indira Gandhi Hospital, Dwarka, Delhi. Her topic is about her uh, Australian experience. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, All India Ophthalmological Society and uh, Women of Ophthalmological Society for giving this opportunity to talk about my experience in Australia. 
and a special thanks to ranjana ma'am and india ma'am they uh, encouraged me because i'm like i'm not a very good orator <laughs> i fumble a lot when i speak in public i'm a very uh, very less talkative person but still thank you um, so first of all i want to say uh, about this ico fellowships they are basically uh, mainly the short term fellowships and india ma'am has already talked about uh, the long term fellowships you know one or two year fellowships which are good for the ms graduates like who has recently passed out and they have time and they can invest uh, their energy right so long term fellowships are for those people these ico fellowships being the short uh, short term fellowships they can be taken up like even with your busy lives matlab because they are short term so anybody can take even uh, established ophthalmologists can take out time from their life and can get these and these fellowships are generally um, like observerships kind of fellowships they do not give direct hands on uh but but if you are an already an established ophthalmologist so even this 3 month observership can help you enhance your skills and your practice because after you become experienced uh, just by seeing things you st you can do new things right so uh, dr chaitra has already uh, briefly talked about this fellowship because she has done the same she uh, mainly told you about the benefits i will more uh, talk about like the technical part like how basically to apply for these fellowships i'll go more into detail uh, first of all the ico what basically ico is is the international council of ophthalmologists basically all the national regional and sub specialty ophthalmological societies they have made this uh, ico and they collaborate with each other and they cooperate with each other their main vision is to enhance ophthalmic education improve access to highest quality eye care and to preserve and restore vision for the people of the world the main aim is to strengthen eye care capacity in low and middle income settings to address inequities and pressing public health needs to secure eye health basically what ico aims is that uh, the developed countries they are already giving a good quality eye care to their patients what they want is that all society should work together and even the developing countries are able to save eyes so what they do is they take the candidates or the budding ophthalmologists from the developing countries and train them and send them back to their country so they can use that enhanced skill in their own country and give a better uh, health care so the different type of fellowships which ico uh, uh, provides is uh, three month fellowships which is available in like every uh, sub specialty be it cornea glaucoma neurophthal medical retina uh, you name it like they have uh, short term this three month fellowships in every uh, sub specialty then they have this three month uh, uh, ico world glaucoma association fellowships they are basically more focusing on glaucoma because glaucoma being uh, like irreversible vision loss so they focus more on it then they have this six month fellowships for diagnosis and therapy of retinoblastoma if someone is more interested in uh, doing that they have these research fellowships also and they have uh, got this one year fellowships in ocular genetics if somebody is interested in that uh benefits of ico fellowships uh, chetra ma'am has already said that these fellowships are good for those people who have who are already more established and just by seeing uh, you know or observing things they can enhance their skills is good for them for a fresh candidate just going there and observing things i think it will only help in a way that you can get a broader aspect like what else you want to learn and how else you want to move on in your life just that but otherwise if you think you are going to learn some like hands on or some surgical thing out of it i don't think so then it will help you much so uh, who first the eligibility criteria what is the eligibility criteria for these ico short term fellowships your uh, you should be an ms candidate like your specialty uh, residency training has to be complete and uh, these uh, like you cannot apply in your country like you are in india you cannot apply for ico fellowship in india itself you have to apply it outside and you should be permanently based and work in one of your eligible countries india is eligible country i'm telling you already so uh, and the thing is ki they want you to be uh, already established in your country because sometimes people have a wrong notion that if you'll go and do fellowship there then you can get a license there and you can settle down there it's not going to happen they they want to make sure that you come back to your country they don't want you to settle down there 
so if you are looking out for this fellowship with this purpose in mind that this thing is going to help you like settling down in that other country then this fellowship is not meant for you so all the uh, applicants uh, must be reasonably fluent in the language of the fellowship training center say you are applying in canada or you are applying in australia you must be fluent in english so that way you should be knowing uh the icu recommends that candidates should pass one or more icu examination but as chatra ma'am told these uh, are not like a mandatory condition many can candidates are there who have got the fellowships even without clearing these exams so uh, for applying all you have to do is just make go to their website there is a register uh, uh, option you click on that register you make an icu account select the fellowship and you have to upload your elig matlab the documents of eligibility which will include your nationality like the passport your ms certificates uh, you have to get at least two or three recommendation letters and the references letter you will need they'll check your eligibility and if they found that yes you are uh, like eligible for this thing then you have to apply to a host training which can be like i applied to australia you can apply it anywhere they have a whole lot option throughout the world and if the 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 host is ready to accept you as a 3 month uh, fellow with them then they grant you fellowship and these fellowships are paid fellowships they give you a uh, 6000 uh, uh, us dollars for 3 month which is good amount you can easily manage your going coming and even staying there 6000 is quite good amount so this whole process almost takes 3 to 4 months and these fellowships are granted uh, twice in a year and their deadlines are 31st march and 30th september so what was my experience i uh, did my cornea fellowship uh, in uh, westmead hospital in sydney australia under dr shamin summer vikrama he is a cornea consultant there so i learned there like in two uh, aspects professionally and um, personal level uh, so it it was a very well established medical center with advanced infrastructure good clinical opd sessions uh, in ot also i observed a lot thing uh, because i did my cornea fellowships already from the venue uh, i was doing the penetrating keratoplasties but there i got to i even assisted the lamellar transplant surgeries here but there i got to know that there are like so many more techniques to uh, insert the lamellar transplant so from every person you learn new things and also during my ten tenure there was one more fellow uh, dr pisset delin she was from cambodia she was also through this same fellowship uh, by interacting with her then i also got to know like how in cambodia the i banking works so if you go to uh, such international fellowships definitely you get more exposure your uh, mind is broadened your perspective gets broadened socially i uh, i learned new things i got more uh, kind and calm to the patient otherwise when i was in india i was like little ha ha aao dikhao and like jao but there i got to know that okay they are very 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 respectful to their parent to their patients with every patient they are more dear calm sit and like they were very very like i got to know, learn a lot like i got more <laughs> calmer with the patients and patients are also very patient they are not like here and so are doctors there but it was a great experience and i would really want like all of you should at least once go and do these kind of 3 month fellowships because it definitely makes you learn new things thank you very interesting talk especially the later part which you said yes you learned how to treat the patient differently because here we have so many patients every institute has a rush so you do tend to you know not to go into the niceties and just go to the diagnosis आख में ये डो डो दस आई नो दैट्स अ गुड एस्पेक्ट Thank you for your exhaustive talk, Dr. Minakshi. And now, request uh, our star speaker, Dr. Somshila Murthy. She had another session, but she came over to give us a talk. Her specialization is in ophthalmology from Lokmanya Tilak Municipal Medical College, Mumbai, with clinical fellowship in cornea from LVPI and uveitis and ocular pathology from Doheny Eye Institute, University of Southern California, LA, USA. She is currently head of cornea and anterior segment services and consultant uveitis services at LVPI Hyderabad, a member scientific committee of the AIOS, and viable 185 plus publications. a keen interest in research with more than 20 clinical trials as principal investigator and co-investigator madam has a passion for teaching and takes active interest in training of fellows and dnb students and a recipient of achievement award from 
none less than American Academy of Ophthalmology. Thank you, ma'am, for giving us your time, and thank you, friends, for being patient enough. In the other session, and uh, I think it is definitely my privilege to be part of this session. This is a session I want to be in. And uh, thanks for that very kind introduction, which, is, which was longer than the time allotted to me. So <laughs> I'm actually going to go slightly different, listening to the, I was so engrossed in listening to everybody talk about their fellowships and how they trained. So I am not going there. I'm just talking about the fellowship model at LVP. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because, of course, of the topic given to me, but also because I had, lot of, I had provided a lot of input into how, what would be a perfect fellowship. And uh, unlike uh, the other short-term fellowships, this is a long-term fellowship, so it's like a full-time full commitment. So obviously, most of the many residency programs, except for a few, they have a lot of lacunae in training. So surgically, fellowships are heavy. As you said, OPD load is obviously just volumes. But in that, there is no minimal research. There is no minimal niceties or learning patient care in a better way. And we don't have any subspecialty exposure when we finish residency. So there's a lot and still remaining, there's a lot to be desired, even at the end of three years. I think when I finished my fellowship, I thought I knew a lot. But after, I, when I finished my residency, I thought I knew a lot, because it was in Mumbai, which was surgically heavy. But after we went, after I went to LVP, I realized I really knew nothing, how to deal with the patient and many, many, many other things. So what was the fellowship about? It's that we want all trainees to be fit for general ophthalmology practice to start with, because they come in very raw. They don't know anything. They don't know any examination techniques from some of the residency programs. So therefore, they have to be proficient in the routine general ophthalmology practices. That is as simple as uh, taking the intraocular pressure or fundus indirect ophthalmoscopy, because many residency programs, at least earlier, and even now, they, you learn on your own from your seniors or something. You don't learn. You don't learn it from specialists. So here we have instruction courses or we have sessions on how to do IOP, how to do gonioscopy. So that's what should be part of the module of residency, which is not there. And of course, every general ophthalmologist should be proficient in cataract surgery. So when we had the fellows coming to us, they've done five to 10 cataract surgeries in the residency. That's because of the program or, or maybe COVID, various other problems. And then a resident is not exposed to administrative activities. So you're going out raw to, be, to run your own practice, but you have no idea how to deal with the administrative hassles and things like that. And then after you learn on this, then you should go into a subspecialty. Here we're doing the other way around, barely know anything in residency and directly diving into subspecialty. So what is the three-year fellowship module? In the first year, the very first month that they join in, we, the, we call it an induction training where they're taken through all the processes because ours is a very sort of a oh, big institute and we have electronic medical records, we have so many NABH-related uh, activities and they need to know a lot of things. So that entire one month is gone in that, maybe even learning the local language a little bit. Then after that, the next eight months, we rotate them for four weeks in each subspecialty. So cornea, retina, glaucoma, and so on, plastic pediatrics. And in that, we also divide it so that they get three days there, they get two days to learn cataract surgery. So somebody's holding their hand and teaching them. Of course, if they're already proficient, so less holding the hand, but giving them cases to operate. And then of that, only one day in the week for the first eight months, they spend in this subspecialty, meaning I may have joined for a cornea fellowship, but in my first nine months, I might do just one day a week in, the, in that fellowship, because the rest of the time, I'm learning general ophthalmology. I have to be a general ophthalmologist. So that was in the first year. The second year, we have several rural centers or secondary centers. So this is the best opportunity for the fellows to get much, much better at cataract surgery. So there's always a handover. So the, the senior fellow is already six months there. There may be a faculty, a young doctor over there. And then the new fellow joins in. So under the shadow of the senior fellow, they, they start operating. They do many cases over there. Maybe um, they may, may do maybe around at least 1,000 plus cases or maybe 2,000 cases in the end of the one year. So the end of the one, first year, they're excellent and very competent cataract surgeon. They know how to manage general OPD. They get little administrative experience of running a small center, dealing with staff, and so on. And then it's back to the final year. And this is what most people probably join, because they want to leave as glaucoma specialists, leave as retina specialists. And they don't want to leave as comprehensive or general ophthalmology. That's not why they've come to an institute. So here they come back. Now they have all that in their kitty. They have all that experience now. They've rotated in all the other departments. And in the last 15 months is when they spend in the core specialty. So if they've come for cornea fellowship, 
they'll spend four to five days a week in that core specialty. Of course, the institute assigns various other duties, emergencies and other many other duties that they, are, they have to do as well. And so at the end of three years, which is a long period if you look at it, but the three years is trying to make up for what was not done in the residency. So that's the reason for, for three years. They might, so a cornea fellow typically would have done 1,000 to 2,000 cataract surgeries and would have done at least 150 grafts, if not more. And they would have had at least two publications because that's mandatory. And they do present, get to present at state or national level meetings, sometimes even at international meetings. So this is the scope of the current cornea fellowship. It's, it's very well designed for somebody who's finished their residency. I, I, listening to others, I realize that it's, you can't deep dive into other things and then say, okay, now I'm going to take three years off and come back from my practice and be a fellow. For that person, we have the short-term fellowships as well. So that is good for three, three months. So this is a fellowship which is customized for a fresher, somebody who's finished a residency and then wants to become a specialist. Uh, that's all I had to share. Thank you very much. And thanks for waiting for me. And thanks to Ranjana and the organizers for inviting me. Thank you. I just wanted to ask that, uh, like, three years of any subspeciality training. And then if you want to come to back to a government hospital and then you want to become a faculty, then again, you have to go through a three years of residency program. Do you think that now it's a high years. time that some leeway should be given to the people who have already worked post yes. the residency, they work for three years in some, in ophthalmology, right. and they again go, they're back to square one. So yeah. it's six years of their life yeah. down the line, and there should be more legitimization of this procedure because it's a proven system of training. Unfortunately, there is no certification for this fellowship. It's, it's so a, I think it's this is what AIO is or whatever, we should exactly. be able to pursue this because this is a very important and significant matter because we, it's a question of six years post-residency. I, I completely agree. In fact, I don't know if Dr. Prabhavakar Singh is here. He's from this area and he still has to submit several letters, though he would uh, train uh, colleagues over there or, yeah. or his juniors over there for cataract surgery. He still has to get an experience certificate from, from people in order for him to go to the next level. Yeah. And uh, I think that you're absolutely right now, it's, it's the time for advocacy. Absolutely. And make absolutely. this equivalent to senior residency. Yes, at, at or least at least a couple of years. Make it a one year affair right. that, okay, you just do yeah. one year. Six years, is, it means a lot. Absolutely. For anybody Completely who's agree. It's very, very difficult. Yeah. I mean, you're uh, uh, now in a position in, as an AIOS office bearer to uh, take these matters into hand and to bring it to the. Uh, yeah. No, that's a great idea. Yeah. Yes, I think this is one more battle that we must fight. Yes, absolutely. And this is a very significant battle that would make a difference in so many people's lives. That's right. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank the chair for their inputs and the audience for the patient hearing. This brings us to the end of the session and I think the next session is a cornea session. And you catch it? Group, uh, the presenters, please come and have a group photo.